creating your own world, your own ecosystem. I kind of did the same thing with being on Rado, which is an artist from LA as well. And we pretty much curated a, a new way for LA to where everybody's trying to mimic that sound, you know? But um, can't, can't beat the originator for sure, but. So I'll start this off with you, Carl. Um, so many artists know how to do great creative work, and but they don't all know how to make a living off of it, right? And I wonder how is this changing with the you know progressing world of technology? You think about AI, you think about blockchain, and et cetera. How is it changing for them? Yeah, I think it's getting easier to create music, right? I think you know AI as a tool has always has been there for the past um you know however many amount of years um so making music is a quicker process you know guys don't have to leave their bedroom you know blast is an example of that you know a lot of the, a lot of the music that he makes is creation process he can make the beat you know engineer it mix and master not leave his house right so that that the quickness and the, and the speed in which that you know music can be uploaded and created um allows for that to be a smaller p piece of the creative process right you you create a song um you can do that very quickly and um you know get you now you can handle all the other stuff out there you know developing merch um editing your video working on um you know operating your team so i just think the way that music is created right now allows for um you know efficient um creation of music and, and to that point victor I, you know he talked about the other opportunities that are available to artists to merge and etc and those brand partnerships even do artists need to be able to develop that skill set on their own or are the partnerships with people who know how to do that more important? Um, I mean, you know, it's I feel like every artist who is that you will deem organic is really like true to true to their characteristics. And I think that like the branding factor of it, even with Blast early on, like we really leaned on a lot of stuff that Blast was like he was vegan. He is a producer. So it was able us to lean in on the Rollins and on different food companies and like sustainable food, um, sustainable food outlets to be able to like go in and make sure that the brand was still cohesive and still true to self. But at the same time, it still made sense from an advancement standpoint. Um, I mean, everything I would say in this world has to be mutually beneficial at a certain point. Right. And so whether one person, whether a company is actually giving dollars or whether that it's an artist or rather it's an influencer giving their influence. Um, it's, it's an exchange of something that always is in capital. So I think the from the root of it, when it comes down to the brand and the marketing of it, when you really get down to the organic nitty gritty part of the artist, I think that when you actually see that through, that's the, the best tactic to be able to obtain those brand partnerships. Um, obviously, you, you step outside of that when you start to get into the, the different alcohol brands and stuff like that, NBA partnerships. But just as the core of it setting that foundation, I feel like that that's a great place where we started. Yeah, I love a couple of things you said there, and I want to pitch this to you, Blast. I've heard so many artists talk about how they may not need a label these days because they can build a fan base for themselves. And um, but there's still other another side of that argument to where you talk about well, the reason record labels were who they are was you just mentioned that they had advancement of capital and the ability to create superstars. So I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, what the opportunities and landscape looks like for artists to be able to both provide resources to create their art and to get a bigger footprint in the marketplace. Well, I think it's a case by case scenario. You know, some artists thrive with, with major labels, some artists thrive independently, some artists don't. You know, for me, I, I wanted to build my leverage first. And with that, was investing in myself, learning my craft, um, whether that be bargaining with um, my art versus spending my actual financial dollars, you know what I'm saying? So um, I don't know, it, it's so many channels where you can empower yourself now to where you can learn the business as you grow within the business and not have to really just rush into it just because of the dollar amount, you know? I'm gonna stick with you on this glass. Like, I wonder like, what lack of education or lack of knowledge stood in between artists previously, previously to the, the opportunities that we have today, to realizing the value of their craft 
instead of somebody else realizing the value of their craft? I would say access social media, you know, it's, it's, it's a easier way to get direct to your consumer. Now we have platforms like DistroKid where you can upload straight from your phone and see the stats, see the results. So people are wanting to become their own boss nowadays. It's like, why, why would I have to wait on the middleman when I can go direct to it myself? You know, these different platforms are allowing artists to connect with their fan base. And it, it it's really, you know, knocking these corporations down quickly. You know, we see it happening every day. You know, I want you to pick, I want you to chime in on this. I, I listen to people like Kevin Lyles talk about the, the the need for labels and the place that labels have in the world. And then I hear Steve Style talk about, you know, you don't necessarily need that. And, and in some ways, you may feel like a Kevin Lyles is fighting for his life and fighting for the life of labels. And Steve Style obviously has his own bend. And there's other people having these conversations as well, but it's the, it's the people that first come to my mind. So I, I wonder what you think about this. Like, is the argument that labels present that, you know, they can create superstars and they provide that advance. Is that strong enough for people to be able to continue to want that? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it is in this day and age, right? Like you, you look at different examples and you like, okay, is, is making a superstar, making a strong businessman that those things don't always correlate. And so in the world that we live in now, I think it's about, being able to collect in a mass of abundant assets, you know? And when you think about abundant assets, that doesn't have to deal with tangible money. It could be a consultant on your team. It could be a piece of art in your house, but these are all different things that can allow you to spread your wings a little bit further and be like, okay, now I got a little bit more liquidity. I got some investments on my wall. I may have somebody to call to talk about an investment, to talk through these things that they have already been through. And it just kind of gives you that autonomy to really be like, okay, I don't look at myself or we don't look at ourselves as a music label. We looking at this as a startup company, but that's what it all goes back to is like, what does that company look at their self as? What are their bottom line objectives and what it, where are they trying to be at December 31st at the end of every year? You know what I mean? So it, it, it's really like a gut check for everybody personally, to be honest with you, because I know everybody doesn't have the same morals and values, just like Blast was speaking on earlier the major label system may be right for some people, right? Like some people may just catch a hit that they probably won't never catch again. And they got to cash in while the, and they got to strike while the iron's hot. Right. And that's a case by case basis. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to like young individuals like me, Blast and Carl, um, we're, we're very much so in the space of expanding vertically and being able to span horizontally. And that's just branching out into different fields to make sure that we are using this leverage that we do have right now coming through this, through this entertainment industry. Yeah, and I'm going to come back to this conversation of vertical integration because I think it's really important in, in the particular business model you guys have. But I want Carl to jump in on this because I feel like, you know, there's um, there's a case to be made for people to Victor's point of maybe the label route works for you. Maybe it maybe matter of fact, you thought independent was good for you, but actually you need to take this label deal because of these other factors. And I wonder how you help people think through that. Yeah, you know, I, I always talk about um, there's a legal strategy I developed called LOMO. Right. And Lomo is simple. It means length, ownership, money and obligation. Right. Kind of just your four pillars of a contract. So um, you might want a shorter contract. So that length, that's length. You might want, you know, a smaller project deal, maybe one or two projects. Um, your money. Right. That might be the biggest factor. Um, then ownership, obviously. So I think as an artist, you know, you got to kind of prioritize those things. For some people, maybe the art that they're creating doesn't have that 20 year longevity cycle right so you maybe ownership isn't the priority for them they want to get the money now so they can get out the music industry five to ten years some people say hey i don't want to work i don't want to release you know five albums with that label you know i don't i want a shorter deal um so i can maybe go build my own stuff so i think really just prioritizing lomo right um and you know whether it be length whether it be obligation your money or your ownership um that, that empowers, I think, an artist to make the right decision because you're not going to get all four of those things. You know, that's, that's the perfect deal. Um, so just just ranking those things. Yeah, just because we're having this conversation in the mainstream, there we have so many artists these days or the news of artists coming out that are selling their masters or selling their publishing. Why is that happening with some of our biggest artists to where they're taking a bigger payday today versus something else? Yeah, I, I think... 
you know, just like any other asset, right? When you build a startup or you build, you buy a piece of property, you know, eventually, you know, the goal is to sell it, right? If you built, you buy real estate for 30K and, you know, it's on the market now for $5 million and, you know, whatever that X is, you know, that's a, that's a real win. Um, and I think what, what Vic was kind of alluding to earlier um, about kind of that gut check and knowing who you are, um, a lot of these assets are being built by one or two or three people, right? Really small teams, the artists and the manager, maybe the labels involved. But um, if you, if you re- if we can spend more time dedicating a real staff to some of the assets that are already going for a lot of money, um, I think we could, we could three X, four X those returns, right? We, we don't have dedicated people on these assets. So um, I actually think that's the next stage for hip hop. And Blast, I always notice you because Victor talked a little bit about, and you know, uh, uh, Carl also mentioned this, you know, the idea of the artist being a business in so many respects. And it, it makes me think of something Kanye has said a couple of years ago with, you know, artists should have CEOs. And I wonder what your thoughts are as an artist and as somebody who produces for other people. How do you think about the business of artistry today and creativity today versus how we used to think about it historically? Man, I. I... First and foremost, I, I got to give it up to Carl and Vic when it comes to even leveraging me to still be a creative because I'm a creative at heart at the end of the day. And they allow me to learn the business at a pace that's, you know, not too high information, not too low information. But I think it's valuable to 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 be your own boss in your own right at the end of the day, you know. So, um, you know, what our situation with Red Bull, that was the deal structure that was presented for me to learn you know, take the stairs instead of the elevator. And um, it's valuable, you know, it, it it gives you a peace of mind when you know that your financial situation is, is solid and you're still able to create with a clear mind. I think that's the most important thing that artists overlook sometimes. Yeah, I love that you brought the Red Bull deal because Vic, I, I, I was reading a previous interview that you did and I want you to chime in on this. It, you, you had said when it was time to sort out a, a music partnership, um, you guys stood firmly on vertical integration. I told you I was going to come back to this, which, and a lot of people, a lot of labels were like, you know, that's, we're not, we're not even here for that. But you knew hip hop at the, um, hip hop space at Red Bull was irrelevant. And with Blast being a self-made creative and you wanting to see a label, what other label could do for you other than just distribution, that's how you got to Red Bull. So talk about how that deal was put together and the importance of that deal to his career and the you know success of your business. Yeah, for sure. So I think on the first half of it, um, just when it came to talking points, before it even got to a long form, anything like that, right? It was just us establishing the precedent of what I mentioned earlier. Like, this is a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. Um, Red Bull, me and Blast are from Los Angeles, California. So it's like their office is implanted in our hometown. But at the same time, they have no affiliation with anybody in our hometown. You know, so at the end of the day, we understood like Red Bull does so many different things and they're a vertically integrated company themselves being a private company this long and not going to the stock market. That's actually crazy in itself. So it's like, you know, when I say like organicness just kind of bleeds over, we seen something similar in that business model as well that we wanted to instill in ours. So it's kind of like the spook you sat by the door. Like you go in and, and into these places and really like study the business model and see what you can take from it to add on for the future. Um, but I think on the second half of it, when it came down to that deal structure, I would give a lot of that credit to Carl bringing it, bringing a lot to our plate and really challenging us, um, with a lot of these deal points, about how this stuff was structured and what he said, the Lomo, like that was really a factor in every single part of negotiation and how we got to where we got to. Yeah. Carl, chime in on that. If you could. Yeah. I mean, I, I think honestly, you know, Blast kind of cited, um, you know, me and Vic kind of, you know, helping him focus on the, on the music. But, you know, what I will say is, you know, I think he has really, really good business instincts, right? You know, this is a person who kind of knew he wanted to keep the art pure um, and wanted to be able to create at his speed and at his level and kind of do what he wanted, right? So um, just knowing that, you know, that's a totally different conversation than maybe, hey, let's talk to a record label, get a big check, here are the albums that are committed. That's That's totally different, right? Because now... There's a different level of responsibility um, and, you know, you got to protect the artist's integrity. So um, for him, just to kind of st- say, hey, um, these are the things that are important for us. Um, 
you know, Red, Red Bull met us at the door and, you know, they, they've been gracious partners and, um, you know, and, and they've allowed Eagle and Blast to, to own um, and, and kind of learn with the training wheels on. I think, you know, I, that was really important for us. We're, we were 20 something year old entrepreneurs, right? Um, so so that, that was really important to us. Yeah, I'm gonna stick with you, Carl. This, I, I, I wanted to dig deeper on this partnership with a Red Bull and other partnerships that may come down the line. So often we have these conversations about, hey, we have this asset, or we have this asset, or we have this personality, and who out there in the world is great to marry with this personality to help amplify, create activations, and et cetera. How did you know Red Bull was the right partner for you guys? Obviously, you knew that they had something to give you, but how did you know that you had something to provide them as an asset? Yeah, I think we all, Vic Blast and I all sort of talked about the different verticals of Red Bull that, that cans in every venue across the globe. So like, you know, when we go to London or we go to Paris or we go to these places, Red Bull already has a relationship in those markets. Um, and that was important to us. And then, you know, F1, F1 is, you know, the Red Bull F1 team and all these other, you know, the X Games and snowboarding and um, all those things that I think a lot of people, a lot of labels probably couldn't offer access points to. That's just the reality of it. So I think outside of um, Red Bull Records, right, and whatever, you know, all that they could provide as a marketing partner and, um, you know, a, a financer, Red Bull as a company, you know, allowed allowed us to kind of tap in in ways that we didn't, we, we were never going to probably have those resources or, um, and, and it's, that's held true, I think, so far. And what did you need to know about their objectives in order to make a pitch to them that makes sense? Um, I, I think that we, it kind of goes back to just like respect and appreciation um, for Blast um, first and then for Eagle, right? As us as executives, hey, you know, this is our long-term plan. You know, not only are we going to make sure Blast is set, but, you know, we got, we got, a, we got a business we're building called Eagle um, and we do need some resources. We do need um, respect on that level and they, they appreciated it. And, you know, they, they've been, again, solid partners uh, up until this date and, um you know, we're, we're bringing them talent. We're working together on new stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's been fruitful so far. You know, there's there's so many artists who don't see themselves as brands, Victor. And um, when you think about even going back as far as like Run DMC with Adidas, and the, it was still a long time before people really caught on to what that meant. And even longer before we were able to capitalize on the understanding of what that meant. Um, Let's talk about how brand partnerships are evolving and for artists and brand for for the artists and the brand and other creative verticals. So not maybe maybe I'm not a rapper, but maybe I'm a painter. Maybe I am, you know, some other sort of creative and how these relationships with brands that have products, consumer packaged goods and et cetera, may be evolving over time. Um, I mean, I would say historically hand to hand marketing has always been. It's, it's always been the best way just because I think the emotional factor of it is kind of hard for people to turn down a lot of stuff when it's in front of their face. That's probably half of it. But at the same time, you can really kind of like evoke emotion in person. But, you know, with social media, you kind of get not the same exact effect, but it's direct to consumer at this point. You know, like like Blast was talking about earlier, you know, Distro Kid, you can go straight on there and upload your song right away. Like you really don't have to go sit outside a record label for 12 hours in the cold and then hopefully somebody come outside and you get somebody to play your song on the radio. Now, same thing with artists and painters and, and anything alike. You really have the space to be able to create whatever world you want. So when you come into talking to these brands, you're like, I'm a brand too. I'm no longer a person that's asking for a handout. I'm, I'm somebody that's here to barter my services. And this is more so a work for hire rather than you're just employing me as a person that you may see some type of talent that you can utilize. So... I mean, you know, a lot of those business models, I mean, they still exist, right? You got like the typical Disney stuff where they have the work for hire. You come in, they'll give you a standard check just to record some jingles and stuff like that. And if they own it, I mean, if they if they take it, they own it forever. But you do have so many more outlets to where it's like there's so many different sync opportunities now. That TikTok is a damn near sync opportunity at this point. So when you get down to those different spaces, you understand that. The, the channels and the avenues are way wider than they used to be. And, and it's not as congested 
And it's more, it's a thousand ways to skin a cat rather than a hundred ways to skin a cat for real. So it's all about these leverage points for real, for real. And, that's, and that goes back to how we walked in the building and just understood our negotiation leverage when it came down to ownership. Um, a big thing we always speak about is proof of concept. And across the board, we made sure that we have proof of concept, whether that be an employment factor, whether that be in a music distribution, recording videos, cover art, every single, every single place we knew that we would have to fight for any type of ownership, we made sure that we showed proof of concept and did it at a high level as well. You know, Blast, I want you to chime in on, you know, I, I used to spend some time in the music business and I used to hear producers talk about just particularly, particularly producers versus artists. They would talk about if you're trying to make it in this business as a producer, the, one of the best ways to do it was to find an artist and be that artist's producer, right? And to come in the game and build a repertoire that way. Like you think about going back as far as like Nelly and the St. Louis, it's like they had their own producer and Drake came in with Ovia, like they had their producers. And I wonder what you think are some of the best ways for music producers to find their way in the game today when you just got a song, um, when you have a, you may just have a beat, may not have the lyrics to it. Like how are some of the most effective ways today to find success as a music producer? I think you hit it right on the nail, you know, creating your own world, your own ecosystem. I kind of did the same thing with being on Rado, which is an artist from LA as well. And we pretty much curated a, a new way for LA to where everybody's trying to mimic that sound, you know, but um, can't, can't beat the originator for sure. But uh, I think that's the best way for artists and producers, well, for producers to come up, you know, making sure you link with that that artist and just taking it back to the old days we we appreciate it when you hear that timberland justin timberlake project because of that cohesiveness and that world that they brought you in and how they you know wrote up the entire project is better when two worlds collide together so i think it's dope that producers are becoming brands of their own and um that's something i would consider yeah i, I want you i want to go somewhere else with this with you blast because i and not to compare black music because i love all black music but i think about this progression of like Afro beats and how Afro beats is starting to find its way over the charts versus just traditional hip hop, um, which has dominated the charts for years. And I just wonder what you think about that and like how the proliferation of more types of black music is finding its way into the mainstream. It's a beautiful thing. I think Afro, Afro beats in general is just a universal language that we all just feel good whenever we hear, uh, you know, Afro beat. I don't know what it is, but something in that DNA is just make you want to dance. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to see where music is going in general. And I'm glad to be a part of it, too. You know, I just produced the record on Burner Boy's last album. So, um, you know, I got my foot in the Afrobeat world as well. Yeah. Uh, Vic, I was reading an, an article again, and, and you were talking talking about how you came up in the game. And you were saying how in 2014, you saw that there was a big gap where a lot of artists didn't understand how to monetize their content. And what I think about is what is some lower hanging fruit? Um, because you found a way to help local LA artists monetize their content um, and their, their, their creativity. I wonder what you think about what is lower hanging fruit artists who may be local celebrities in their neighborhoods or in their cities? What are some ways for them to monetize their content that they can take away from this episode? to learn from what you did to help people fund the, the, their future creativity. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I had just got out of grad school, so I was already like doing like student teaching and stuff like that. So it was kind of like second nature for me to kind of sit down with different artists and go through these different content, content ideas and content distribution methods. I mean, one thing that me and Blast did early on that I think that kind of made us a little successful just as far as on the consistency side was, we created a content calendar and I was just making sure that it was consistent. It was consistent noise on the channel throughout the, throughout the weeks, throughout the month, making sure that we had deadlines and markers to hit, but that also challenged you when you seen like, I got a music video doing three weeks. One, where am I going to get this money from? And I got to start saving that money from somewhere Two, how am I going to put the pieces together and organize all of this? But it's a constant reminder that it's like, okay, this is my, my social media channel is now really a channel and I have to keep feeding these people. And rather the, the attention span is so short these days is like, you got to keep feeding every time, every time. And it's like, 
to be able to do that at a high level, you also got to understand how to collect on the back end of that. And I think that just comes down to doing homework. Like, that's always my first advice. Like, don't be afraid to go and figure out and read what you're actually getting back from this so that when you actually are strategizing prior to releasing this stuff, you know what numbers you're trying to hit because you know what money that's going to make you back and you know what your prime objective is. So I think that's the first part of it when they're talking about monetizing content. You just got to understand what you're trying to monetize first and foremost. But I think the the lowest hanging fruit is people often go away from where they're celebrated and they like to go where they're tolerated. And that's just more so from a mindset of trying to collect new fans, but not understanding that your fans that you have underneath you right now are the people that's going to really champion you and take and go to bat for you and really advertise your music. So the more you feed into your core fan base and build community, that's it makes it easier when you get to YouTube and you start distributing content and people under them comments really championing what you got going on because they can attest to what's, what that is. Same thing with Instagram, same thing with TikTok, same thing with people conversation on Twitter. So um, my bad for being a little long winded, but that that's definitely like my perspective on all of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carl, I think about, we've been having this conversation about the evolution of the music business, the evolution of distribution and et cetera. And I want to talk to you about like the evolution of law when it comes to how we manage these things with creative industries. And I was reading an article where you said, you know, I think a lot of legal strategies are based on the industry that existed previously, as opposed to the industry that will exist in 20 years that will include new tech and media. And I wonder if you were to put on your futuristic hat and you see the direction we're going in with blockchain, you see the direction we're going in with AI, you know, what are some of the things that you're paying the most attention to so that you can position your partners like Blast and Vic and et cetera, and even the people in, in, the, in the location that you guys were in, which we're going to talk about, um, how do you position them best for the future? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really about not being afraid of technology, right? I think law and technology and advancement, you know, those things kind of conflict, and I, I feel that um, I feel that now with the AI conversation, um, you're seeing that you know people taking down music, you know, everyone's afraid. Um, it's really nothing. It just it, this happens every twenty, thirty years in the music business or just in business in general. Like there's a new medium or technology that comes into play that sort of makes things change right um so embrace technology you know you you have to learn how blockchain helps or hurts your business you have to learn how ai can be used as a tool to make your workflow faster um to to address creative block um all that good stuff right because the bad stuff we we already know the bad stuff people can make music faster that's a good and a bad right so now there's you know the the number that um i hear often is like there's sixty thousand songs a day being uploaded to spotify Right. Like, you know, so there is it, it is noisy, um, but but who cares? Right. Like you stand out by, you know, being real in your community, um, you know, having stain, you know, all those things are, are still the same. So embrace technology. That's 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 the legal strategy I have, um, because I'm looking at AI. Um, I'm not afraid. I'm like, how can I even help it increase my legal pro- productivity? Right. Because there's legal chat GBT. There's legal. Um, tools yeah. that make my job easier. I'm not redlining anymore, right? I'm like, you know, let me put this in this in this <laughs> technology. I'll just, yeah, so it, it makes our life easier. So I, I, I want people to think about technology that way. Yeah, and I, let's go a level deeper there because you know we, we talk about AI, and I'm sure you guys have heard like the 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 fake Drake and the fake Weekend record that came out a little bit ago, and how good it is at mimicking their voice and. I wonder, and I'm going to pitch this to all three of you guys because you all come from different perspectives on this. Where do you hope this goes with regards to protecting the artist, um, protecting their vocal impression, and et cetera? So I'm, I'll, I'll start with Blast. I'm 50 50 with it. I, I can't lie to you. Where do I hope this goes? I mean, I hope we develop some type of system like Universal is talking about being able to take things down, you know? Um, but it, it's kind of hard to really control your your voice likeness, you know. You're like somebody still can use it to ability to where they can, whether they can get clout off of it still. Even if we do get to a point where we're able to take it down, like I think the kids are gonna work it to where <laughs> they still yeah. get a win out of it some way. So I don't know. It, it's just something that, like Carl said, we have to embrace. But 
I'm excited to see how it unfolds. I'm kind of scared though. I know he said don't be scared, but I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Victor, I want I want to hear you, I want to hear you on this. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm I'm all for embracing it. To be honest with you, I mean, it, it's kind of like it's an it's an inevitable. You can't really. I mean, obviously there'll be measures to stop it and stop certain stuff eventually. But just like Blast said, like. It's always going to be a back end to something that like there was a line wire, right? At a certain point, we was able to get this music free. And so it's just always going to be something a step ahead of technology that's going to allow, obviously, this AI too to to make some different plays. But I mean, on the side of, on the artistic side of it all, I think that it can give it a value similar to like real art. Like when you see people start really mimicking these Basquiat paintings and all this type of stuff, it just drives the value of the original much, much higher. So, I mean, that that may be a, a far off concept right now, but I do think that it'll have some of that type of effect down the line. And fr- from a legal perspective, um, Carl, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, these we got to find some way to regulate these things. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Yeah, it definitely feels like a regulation issue, right? You know, before someone's able to upload on the DSP, maybe um, whether it be the DSP having some responsibility to create technology that can trace that AI was used, right? Or maybe that's a question um, before it's uploaded. Did you use AI, artificial intelligence or not? Um, you know, you, you got to be able to, um, there, there has to be some sort of regulation around it. Um, the reality, I've also been seeing some creative solutions, right? Like, you know, I saw Grimes, uh, an artist, a very creative artist, you know, tweet out like, hey, you know, I don't care if you could use my my voice, just I need 50% of the song, right? It, it just That's just a funny way to, to, to handle it. But like, then you start, your mind starts churning, like, okay, like, you know, that song probably can't be copyrighted, but what if I'm, what if Drake is eating off that record or Future's eating off the record, Universal's eating off that record? Definitely makes it a little less um nerve wracking right because you know you kind of add it to your catalog so um just just being open to those solutions i don't think that is necessarily the solution but um that sounds a lot i think a lot more artists and creatives and industry people would be um a lot less afraid if they knew that you know they they could get a cut off some of the the music yeah and i want to end here because i know like education and teaching has been super important to you guys and whichever that, whichever of you is most in most intimately involved, like rec Philly and et cetera, I'd love you to chime in here. Um, Cause I think about the importance of community with regards to creators. And I would love to touch on, I love, would love to you guys touch on why, you know, wrapping community around creators is so important. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll start and, you know, Blaster Vic when I want to hop on and chime in, but you know, I, I grew up in the Philadelphia area. So the founders of Rec Philly are, are two of my, two of my buddies. I, I've seen when Will, um, Will and Dave started Rec Philly in a warehouse in North Philly and they were bringing out, um, you know, real community leaders to, to, to that North Philly warehouse. And um, it was just awesome to see. Um, then you just see them get a new spot right in the heart of downtown and, you know, they, 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 they're a gym for creatives, right? So they have a podcast studio, multiple, they have multiple recording studios, they have co-working space, um, they have a store in the front of house, and then they also have a Live Nation stage. So um, we talked a lot about um, kind of the farm to table mindset in music, right? Meaning you can create all the, you can, you could, you know, release a song, um, develop your marriage, connect with a graphic designer, and then perform the song later. Then you can meet other people in your community in that same space. Um, creatives really don't have those spaces, right? Like that, I can't think of, you know, maybe it's your local coffee shop. Uh, maybe it's, uh, it, they, they've never had dedicated spaces like that to, to network naturally. Um, so Red Philly is a place that provides resources for creatives directly at a, at a very reasonable and modest price. Um, and you're seeing the model develop, right? They got Rec Philly, but you know now they're opening up Rec Miami later this year, um, and around led by Diddy and and obviously Eagle, we we invested as well. Um, so so we're excited to help not just um, support that initiative, but you know really be a part of the education that they create. Vic, do you want to chime in on that or, or blast? I mean, yeah, no, I think. <clears throat> I think the what we're doing with the VC firm is really just kind of like our proof and to put into what I was saying earlier about just us staying true to our origins. I mean, all three companies, Rec Philly, um, Cafe Erzuli, which is a company in Brooklyn, and then we getting into the live performance space as well with that. Um, and then Chubby Snacks, which is a healthy, sustainable food product. 
So, you know, th those are just all coming back to our core values. We, we're obviously involved in music and live performance space, but we're also involved in the teaching and the educational side of becoming an entrepreneur around this entertainment industry. And then we all know that <clears throat> in inner city communities, those are all food deserts. So it's like, why not invest into something that we can be able to have a part of giving back to our community, at least taking a step forward towards where we should be going. Yeah, I think an artist like Nipsey Hussle, like the legacies that the blueprint that he left behind, and, you know, Carl and Vic always present opportunities like this. But for me, it, it's like, why wait till later to be active in your community? A lot of people wait till they like retire or, you know, when they get a certain amount of money to be able to invest back in their community. But I want to not only leverage my dollars, but leverage my likeness as well. Like I know kids look up to what I'm doing right now. So it's like, let me, let me be active and use my voice and use my presence to influence kids in, in the community to, to do something dope, like invest in a, a rec filly or invest in a healthy snack that something that aligns with your integrity and what you represent. We represent a healthy lifestyle and education. So it goes hand in hand. Yeah, I love that. And I'm going to lead us with a question about Eagle Venture specifically. And I think about um, Carl and Victor, which are, you guys want to take this. And so many investors have a thesis about, you know, we're, we measure every potential investment against this future idea of the world. And I wonder what your, your if you have a thesis, an investment thesis, like what could, could you define it for us? Yeah, yeah. I think really just bridging the gap between, um, you know, for, for us, I, you know, I think Blast just hit it. It's just bridging the gap between our community and a healthier lifestyle, right? And um, generational wealth, all those sort of things, right? So um, it's all, there's always going to be a community play to things that I think we invest in early. Um, not saying we, we're, we wouldn't, you know, someone's in the, a nice deck for a tech company that had a lot of upside that we wouldn't invest in it. Um, what I'm saying is I think um, the backbone of who we are as a company, we want to stay true to. Vic said that several times, Blast mentioned that again, but um, how do we bring, um, how do we, how do we bring some of those resources and assets back to the community and how can our people value, how can our people benefit from our investments, not just us, you know, getting a 10 X, 20 X, 50 X return, you know, has to be bigger than that. So, you know, you know, we get chubby snacks to send out, you know, product all the time, you know, rec Philly, you know, um, you know, whenever we have people in, in, the, in Philly, we, you know, we can get them in the space and use all those resources. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of the ecosystem we want to create. I hear that. Thank the Carl Blast. Appreciate you, gentlemen. Very much. It was a good time. Absolutely.